Um, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kate Cagney. I'm the director of the Institute for Social Research. So glad you could participate in, in Insights today. Um, but let me tell you about Charlotte Cavalier. Today she'll share with us her research from her 2023 book, Fair Enough, Support for Redistribution in the Age of Inequality, which is based on her dissertation work that received the 2016 Mansur Olson Best Dissertation Award. Congratulations. Work sets forth a new framework for studying attitudes toward redistributive policy, uh, and uh, she'll address attitudinal trends in post-industrial democracies, including a decline for support for redistribution in Great Britain. I think with that, I'm going to close and hand things over to Charlotte. She has invited you to ask questions of clarification while she's speaking, but if you have more expansive content-related questions, um, she asks that you hold those until the end. Uh, thank you to Ken Coleman and the Center for Political Studies. This was Ken's suggestion, and clearly we filled the house. So appreciate you sticking with us. Charlotte, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We made it. OK. So thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you, Ken. Ken has been amazing since I moved to Michigan. So I want to take this opportunity to say, I know everything you do for me. I see you. Thank you. There's other folks in the room who actually helped with this book. I see you too. Thank you very much. I had a book workshop with a bunch of faculty at U of M. So thank you so much. So to make sure, I think by now you know if you're in the right room, but just in case. So this is a talk on a book that uh, just came out. It exists. Uh, the cover is made by my brother, who's a designer, so that's very cool. So who's the target audience? It's anyone who thinks about redistributive politics and wants to know more about what we call the demand side of redistributive politics, especially now in times of rising inequality. It's anyone who's more from a social psychology perspective, who wants to understand how people reason about these issues, inequality and redistribution in general. And if you are someone who works with survey data and wants to know how to measure people's preferences on these topics, their attitudes, then I think you can learn a lot from this book, which kind of more applies. So I think it's, it speaks to the theory folks and political economy all the way down to the more applied folks. So let me tell you how, um, how I motivate the, this book, why you should want to read it, what's the kind of Starting puzzle, what's the research question? So it's the one that I think a lot of academics are asking. I call it the missing left turn, which is the following. This is data plotted uh, from um, you know, uh, Piketty's you know, publicly available data set. And so it plots for Great Britain and the United States the share of national income in a given year that goes to the top 10% of the income distribution. That's in blue, OK? And the share that goes to the bottom 50% here, I think I plotted. No, 60%, so even more than the majority, in a given year. And so, especially in the US and the UK, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these trends. They're going in different directions. And so, of course, the question is, why isn't the bottom trying harder to expropriate the top? And, you know, you could say it's a very kind of left-wing question to ask, but actually there are base, very simple models in political economy that predict that they should just because it's in their self-interest, okay? So irrespective of what you think of the question, there are good reasons, at least a priori, to think this, why they're not expropriating uh, the top. So how do we know they're not? There are many ways to look at this, but let's look at public opinion data. So this is the general social survey. It's the famous one question we have that kind of asks, tries to pick up these attitudes over time. So the respondents are faced with the following. Think of a score of one, meaning that the government should not concern itself with reducing income differences and a score of seven as meaning that the government ought to reduce the income differences between the rich and the poor, where do you fit? Okay, that's the item that's been asked regularly. And when you look at the trends, I've kind of broken it down by whether or not people choose a number that it's mostly on the, the government should reduce differences side, mostly on the government should not bother itself with that, and the folks who chose the kind of in-between answer, the neither nor, and as you can see, while there is fluctuations in a given year, overall, the long-term trend is one of stability. Okay. So stability does not mean things are not happening. It's at the aggregate. Something could be happening under the hood. So at a minimum, if we start with simple priors, we're like, well, could it be that the rich are getting less and less in favor of redistribution, while the poor are becoming more and more in favor, such that they're canceling each other? So let's look at the differences in patterns of answers between the rich, the top 20th percentile, and the poor, the bottom 20th uh, percentile, or the bottom quintile. 
And so here I take the difference between the two. So what does a dot mean? It's for a given year. So for a given year, on average, the uh, top quintile is more likely to give an answer that is more less favorable to redistribution. There is an income difference there, OK? But over time, it's declining. If anything, income differences in how people answer this question is declining over time. So overall stability, and if anything, a decline in the extent to which income structures how people answer this question. So what about the UK? So the UK is a fascinating puzzle. So depending on which data set you look, you look at, whether it's the British election study or the British social attitude study, you get a different answer. One of stability, one of decline. In any case, you're not getting evidence that support for redistribution is increasing. So the British um, election study asks, do you, do you disagree that income and wealth should be redistributed towards ordinary working people? Again, some fluctuation, but over time, roughly 50% argue agree. When you take the British Social Attitude Survey, which is, again, these are highly reputable, very well-run, very expensive surveys. If anything, you're picking up a decline. There, the wording is a little different. Government should redistribute income from the better off to those who are less well off. That's the percentage, percentage who agree. It's kind of declined, recuperated a little bit, but not as much. We're not at the levels that we saw in the late 1980s. So not only are we not seeing an increase, if anything, we're not even getting the same answer depending on the survey we're looking at. OK? So what's going on here? So the goal of the book is to answer this question in the following way. How can we reconcile these empirical patterns that I showed you with what I find pretty reasonable assumptions regarding the fact that people think about redistribution in a self-interested way? I think that's a nice starting point. So what is saying they think redistribution is going to hurt them or benefit them in terms of their pocketbook? So how can we reconcile these empirical patterns with these assumptions? The second thing is, Within the same country, such as the UK, can we make sense of different tre trends across two data sets that are sampling from the same population? Like, I want to be able to explain that. I also want to be able to explain the US and the UK with the same framework. So if there are Americanists in the room, this big division of political science where theories developed for America are not always used to explain Europe and vice versa. So I want to make sure I have a theory that really explains what's going on in both countries. There are more countries in the book. You know, for the talk, I'll, I'll keep it to two. And most importantly, in developing this framework and answering all these puzzles, can we come up with a theory that provides a plausible explanation for the missing left turn? I say plausible explanation because by definition, we're never going to be able to test that theory. Okay? Ultimately, when you're talking about these big trends at the country level, you are building plausible stories, hopefully built on very strong micro foundations. Okay? So I'm going to try to convince you that um, I have this kind of strong theoretical framework that allows me to say something smart about the book. So of course, I argue that the book does everything that I just listed. And so just to give you the intuition, at least the micro foundations of the, of the theory provided in the book, this idea that people form their attitudes primarily based on their general intuition about what is fair. However, they can revise their ju judgment as a function of a redistributive policy's impact on their own pocketbook, depending on how much the information they have about this impact and depending on the size of this impact. And so if you think of it as this kind of back and forth between fairness and self-interest, and you try to understand how policy design, how elites, the way elites talk about fairness, shape, kind of affect which of these two legs matter the most, you can start explaining quite a lot. OK? So that's the general intuition. So let's do it simple. I'll talk you through the argument. Now you have a bit of the intuition. And then we'll go back to the puzzles I just I, uh, highlighted, going kind of backwards, starting with the UK and finishing with the missing left turn. And again, especially when I talk about the argument, feel free to jump in with questions. So it is a book that has fair enough in the title. So the big kind of contribution, at least, is trying to bring in all the work that's been done on moral reasoning and fairness reasoning into the studies of redistributive preferences, at least as it happens in my neck of the woods in social science. So fairness reasoning, how do I come to it? Well, I actually come to it by starting with material self-interest. I think, OK, what does it mean? 
to behave in a self-interested way, to reason in a self-interested way about a specific policy issue. It means that I'm able to answer at least two questions on a given policy. Will I be affected by this policy? And how will I be affected by this policy? Okay. If I can't answer this question, I can't reason in a self-interested way about a specific distributed policy. So reasoning in a self-interested way assumes a world of certainty. I can answer these two questions. Will I be affected? No, yes. If yes, how much? A little, quite, <laughs> a lot. You know, the stakes vary. As I'm sure you're all aware, because you're all citizens of a complicated country called the United States, or maybe other countries, but uh, in practice, the way you experience these policies is an unknown quantity. You might know you're affected, but you don't know how much. It depends on what's going to happen. You're too busy to even gather the information. Um, and so or you might not even know if you're going to be affected by this policy. So it's an unknown quantity. However, despite the fact that we are not put in this situation, and that's the intuition in Schumpeter, this is, this is not me in particular, despite the fact that you are not put in a situation where it's easy for you to reason in a self-interested way, you are drawing on some other ways of thinking that allow you to come up to a pretty strong conclusion about what you think about redistributive um, uh, social policy. So what are you using? Using other heuristics, other ways of thinking. And the ones I'm more interested in is fairness reasoning. There are other types of heuristics that matter, but I think this one does quite a lot of, of, of work here. So what do I mean by that? I mean that when you are thinking about redistribution, or in the context of a survey, when you are answering a question like the ones I just showed you, I'm trying to do the fair thing, meaning provide the fair answer. Pick the policy preference, in this case the survey answers, that increases fairness. All right, what does that mean? Well, to increase fairness is to pick a policy that moves the status quo closer to what is prescribed by shared norms of fairness. Okay, so that's the ought. What ought to be? Does this policy move the status quo in that correct direction? So for reasons I won't go into tons of detail, but um, the reasons that explains why people actually keep uh, a running tally of the fairness of the status quo. They're constantly wondering, is it fair? Is it fair enough? Is it fair enough? Is it fair enough? In the process, they develop beliefs about the extent to which the status quo conforms to what, what these norms prescribe. I'm going to call them fairness beliefs for short. Okay? They're different from the norm here. And so what is interesting is that the way people answer surveys when they're thinking about fairness it's not because they disagree on what is fair. It's because they disagree in terms of their fairness beliefs. They disagree in terms of the running tally they've been, the tally they've been running about the fairness of the status quo. They differ in their fairness beliefs, okay? Not in their agreement with norms of fairness. Chapter two in the book, if you disagree with that, this type of evidence I So what I, what is interesting here is to think of these fairness beliefs as a proto-ideology, a mental map that people use to form policy preferences in a complicated, uncertain world. Of course, sometimes the world is more certain, and that's when they start deviating from saying what is fair. So we'll get to that. So let me give you a flavor of these uh, fairness beliefs. So one is a bunch of Occupy Wall Street slogans. Um, I realize I have students in the room. You might not remember that part. <laughs> Uh, but that was formative when I was uh, kind of finishing undergrad and a grad student. On the right, on your right, is an excerpt from Ariel Hochschild's Stranger in Their Own Land. Both are narratives that are conveying some sense of unfairness, okay? So on the left, let's start with the left. They got a bailout, we got sold out. Bill is for bankers, hell no. I participate, you participate, he participates, we participate, they profit, okay? My favorite one, the free market keeps giving me the invisible finger. Okay. So what's going on here? What kind of sense of unfairness is being expressed? So a bit tongue in cheek here, but I, I think I can use Milton Friedman to, to speak about what kind of moral norm has been broken and that is at least partly expressed by, the, by these Occupy Wall Street soldiers is this idea that capitalism is no longer de delivering in terms of payment and according to product. That's what uh, Milton calls it, as the core value judgment that are unthinkingly accepted by the great bulk of society's <coughs> members. And so in his terminology, 
that norm is important, and, and it's important that it be respected because it's what sustains an efficient market, okay? So another way to think about this is that it's the moral principle underpinning market institutions to which I would add education, the, edu the you know, as a, another institution that kind of feeds um, into our marketization as commodities on, on markets. It's a norm that encourages effort and monitors envy. You cannot be envious if the differences are fair, okay? And so I think of this norm as the proportionality norm that will always be proportional to merit, all right? And again, feel free to, to jump in if you, if you have questions, if you disagree with me. <coughs> Um, so what's interesting with this norm is that in econ, when you think about this, the more they talk about efficient markets, actually, if you look into the detail, what they mean by efficient markets is that it means designing institutions that are fair according to the proportionality norm. It's institutions that reward skills. You know, your, margin, your wage is equal to your marginal productivity. It literally means that that's a good market. It's a fair market according to this norm. So this language on the left is saying the status quo, sorry, the SQ, not QS, is unfair as defined by the proportionality norm. So what's happening on the right? They ex they're expressing some sense of unfairness, but it's a little different. There's a different flavor here. What are they saying? So that's, do, do who knows the book, by the way? Who, who, who does not know the book? Okay, so Ken. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> It's a book, Ariel Hochschild, uh, kind of, I can't remember, she must have started it before Trump was elected, but she basically goes to Louisiana and talks to a bunch of folks to understand, you know, capitalism has destroyed your state through pollution, et cetera. Why are you not voting Democrat? Okay, that's kind of the basic. And that is how she summarizes what she thinks the storytelling that's happening in Louisiana sounds like. You see people cutting in line ahead of you to affirmative action plans, pushed by the federal government, they are being given preference for places in college, and they, in colleges and universities, apprenticeship jobs, welfare payments, and free lunches. And who are they? Women, immigrants, refugees, public sector workers, that echoes Kathy Kramer's work on uh, Wisconsin. <coughs> uh, where will it end? Your money is running through a liberal sympathy sieve. You don't control or agree with. So your money, you're contributing to something, and going to a bunch of people that you don't think deserve that money, okay? And that's unfair. So what's going on here? Well, I actually could not find one author. It's more all these authors together that have studied this, this from Margaret Levy to Eleanor Ostrom, uh, Bo Rothstein in Europe, as the more examples. So this idea that you ought to be kind, you ought to be altruistic, conditional on others' corporativeness. That is among the basic core of value judgment that are unthinkingly accepted by members of a well-defined group who own solidarity to each other. It helps sustain, in the case I study, redistributive social insurance, the welfare state, okay? That's kind of the norm. So here, what they're, they're, this norm, uh, some kind of old literature that shows how it's important to maintain cooperation and especially social solidarity, meaning we're all contributing to a common pool and when someone hits hard times, we're totally fine with seeing that individual walk away with a bit of that pot of money. And we could also even be fine if that person walks away constantly with more money than they contribute because they deserve it, right? And so why? Because it's not their fault, because they're in, this, they're in a situation of needing to draw on the collective resources. They've tried hard to not be in this situation and failed, again, for reasons that are not their fault. That's kind of the moral framework here. And so that norm encourages resource pooling and monitors resentment. So I don't know if you're part of a large family, but there's always someone who takes a bit more than the rest and you get a little resentful, but you're like, well, oh, but he deserves it. You know, he's, he's growing or whatever. Um, I love pasta and I have very bad memories of not getting enough of it. Um, so what's interesting about the proportionality norm is that it raises very different concerns. We're in a different institutional context, basically. One where free riding is an issue, free riding is not an issue in markets. Markets are designed to not even bring to mind the issue of cooperation and free riding. And of course, uh, for the kind of philosophers in the room, Michael Walzer uh, writes about this in chapter two of Tears of Justice. You can only be reciprocal to people within a well-defined group. Like this norm 
raises issues of group membership and group boundary. Let me ex explain, uh, illustrate to you why these are two different norms and ways of thinking about what's fair by taking the example of immigrants. So immigrants in markets, based on the proportionality norm, are actually very deserving. They're hardworking. And so most people, when you ask them, think they deserve a higher wage than they get. However, immigrants in the, concept, in the context of social solidarity, their, their position as deserving, being able to contribute and draw from the common pool, is more in question. Some they're outside. They haven't contributed enough. So there's a lot of the rhetoric in Europe, of course, is you have to pay two, three, five years before you start drawing from the welfare state. There, they're more suspect of being undeserving of um, the benefits of social solidarity. Okay, so everyone's all on board with the two norms here. We're good. But to sum up, there are at least two flavors of fairness considerations. You can think about them as differences, as um, answers to the following questions. Are market income differences fair? That is, are they mostly due to effort, skills, and talent? And people answer these questions differently. And the other one is, is social solidarity done fairly? That is, do social policies mostly reward team players? And again, people answer these questions differently. The way they answer these questions, actually, pretty thick. once they've answered it one way, it's kind of stable over time, and it really shapes how they think about redistribution when the, the fairness module is activated, right? So again, two flavors of fairness beliefs. I'm going to call, I'm going to call them proportionality beliefs and reciprocity. <coughs> And to capture them, unfortunately, uh, well, the, the approach I took, because I was dependent on um, existing surveys, is to use any items that tap into these issues. So you know, does effort pay? To what extent is the educational system fair, et cetera? All these things are highly correlated. For the reciprocity beliefs, it's more questions about, you know, do you think social benefits make people lazy? Do you think unemployed people could be working? It's really these questions that tap into the prevalence of free riding among the beneficiaries of social solidarity, okay? So what's interesting is that the way people answer the first question is actually quite self-serving. People who win the capitalist educational rat race are more likely to find it fair. Of course, there's tons of variance, but on average, if you look at education or income, there are differences that kind of align with our expectations, okay? And so that means that building a theory a fairness, that kind of fairness reasoning, we've got the tools, especially in econ, political econ. The social solidarity story is much messier, and so I won't go into tons of detail here. All I'll tell you is this. So remember, this is how I defined this other norm, this reciprocity norm. And it has this punishment perspective, which is I'm nice if you're nice. All right, let's go there. I'm nice if you're nice, but I'm gonna be really mean if you're mean. Okay, and so that punitive aspect, a lot of the moral apparatus that, we're, that folks are using in the context of thinking about what to do with free riders is very similar to the same one you see when we talk about retributive justice, okay, in a totally different context or in order. So you're, there was nodding, <coughs> law, the legal system, et cetera. And so what that means is that in practice, how people answer this question is very well predicted by what political scientists very unhealthily call liberal authoritarian values, which actually have a, their origin at U of M with Engelhardt's work. Uh, you know, we can, I'll stop there. Uh, but what that means is that we know that higher educated, higher occupational status is associated with more liberal values and actually is associated with an answer to this question that is, no, there's no free writing, it's not a problem. It's actually the lower educated, the people of lower social status that are more likely to think social solidarity is done unfairly, all right? So as a result, these two things are actually very separate in the data. So let me just show you very briefly with British data. Okay, so you got that, that idea. So this is the British Social Institute survey. So we're very lucky in England. Um, I don't know, the history, it would be interesting to see the history of the survey. But anyway, they've got these two blocks of items. The first one is really tapping into whether or not you think social solidarity rewards free riding. So it's questions about, do unemployed people really try to find work? <coughs> Most people on the dole, which is welfare in the UK, the old term, are fiddling, cheating, and a bunch of questions on, do you think social benefits 
make people lazy, like turn them into free riders. And then the other one is what we would call old labor. So if you remember the new, the new old, the old labor before the new labor, before Tony Blair, they had more of a kind of Marxist undertone. And so some of these items were developed at the time and they're really capturing, do you, do you agree or disagree that the economy is divided between the kind of capitalist employers and um, you know, the workers? Do you think there's one law for the rich and the poor? Do you think big businesses can be trusted? You know, they benefit owners at the expense of workers. What is interesting is this block of item is really correlated with the typical redistribution question we use. Do you think the government should redistribute income? And so if you do a bunch of analysis, including here um, a confirmatory factor analysis, many other types of analysis, which is really trying to see accounting for measurement error, accounting for other things, to what extent how you answer the first block of items is informative of how you answer the other one. Basically, there's no correlation between the two kind of latent dimensions there. Over time, depending on the, the year, it increases to 0 0.2, but it's 0 to 0 0.2. It's really not well correlated. So what does that mean? It means that if I know that you think there's a lot of free riding, I know you're going to answer the first block of items, but it tells me nothing about the kind of modal answer you're going to give to questions about should the government <coughs> redistribute income? OK? Any questions there? Yeah. Do you think in the British context, the unemployed or the poor are like universally a category that's consistent across groups. Like I know we mentioned immigrants earlier, obviously racialized attitudes play a role into how people understand that group that's deserving or not deserving. Is that something that you think is maybe less or more applicable in Great Britain for these answers? Yeah, yeah, so this is important because I'm actually not gonna talk about it. So what about the fact that maybe it's just about the perceptions of the poor belong to an out group that could be racialized or the immigrants. And so I'm gonna say, Yes, but that's kind of a second order consequence of the framework I'm, I'm pre presenting. And the UK is super interesting because all the way until the EU expansion in the mid 2000s, the welfare queen trope was actually a white person. It was not racialized. It got more racialized with EU expansion. And actually, it's the Romas who are kind of the group that's now becoming. But they're actually quite a small group. So again, the way welfare is racialized, I think it's a very American story. Um, I guess like a, it's not irrelevant. Like a follow up is like if the proportionality norm is about free riders, is it the case that like the dimension of how someone might perceive a potential free rider is just already skewed based on that person's identity? Or is the framework like, no, in this world, perception of a free rider is actually dependent on like merit or like me comparing potential free riders would be consistent no matter the identity of the person. For a given individual, yes. Okay. The evidence, and even the evidence in the US is that, right? So uh, specific individuals, in respect of their race, if, if they're free riders, that's the thing. If they're doing something that violates this norm of reciprocity, I'm going to punish them as respective of their race. The problem, of course, we live in a large society where we develop stereotypes, and they definitely are racialized in the US context. But for the moment, I kind of sure. step back, because I'm not there to explaining where the beliefs come from yet. Thank you. So I've got some evidence for the US, which is a bunch of items that ask about kind of old, like think left, right, uh, kind of old labor types of items, about businesses. Do you think hard work pays? Uh, do you think there's too much power concentrated in the hands of big companies? All this kind of goes together nicely. You can, begin, you can build an index. And then I see whether or not that index predicts your answer to the question, poor people have become too dependent on government assistance programs. This is the only data set I found where there were kind of the two types of items together. And so I think there's no relationship. So what it means is that, again, how lefty you are on the first one, kind of traditional economic issues, says nothing about how you think about government assistance programs. Okay? So what are the implications, very briefly, for how we think about demand for redistribution? Well, in my literature, we tend to stick to a single item that says, do you think government should redistribute from the rich to the poor? Or we try to use a bunch of items and build what we call an economic position on an economic proto-ideological continuum. Well, that's a bit messy, because in practice, you really need to specify what kind of income of redistribution you're thinking about. Is it the kind that interferes with market income? Or is it the kind that makes social solidarity more redistributive? 
And when it comes to the continuum, I'm like, OK, deep down, when you're measuring these latent continuums, you're tapping into fairness beliefs. But which one are you interested in? OK? And so a lot of papers I get to review are partly messy because they're an artifact of the fact that the measurement strategies don't overlap with the kind of latent concepts uh, that, are, that are underlying. And so basically, in, in kind of quick summary, is that a lot of the literature when, was focused on fairness as this unidimensional version vision of it, which is if you think effort pays, then you think income differences are fair, and then you think there should be less redistribution, the converse on the other end, when in practice it's much more complicated, and in this case, you know, two, I argue that two dimensions do a pretty good job, but you actually need to separate between the two, and people's attitudes towards redistribution can't just be thought in this unidimensional way. So I'm putting this there for, this, for the survey folks here working on this. So let's bring material self-interest back in. How does it work? So remember, I'm saying when you're in the yellow quadrant, you're a little lost. So you're going to say the fair thing, because you don't know how to say the self-interested thing. But if you notice, under some conditions, I might be able to say yes, and I might have a sense of, the, of how low stakes or high stakes things are. So what happens then? So one way to think about this is to think about people on this continuum. They're either, either in a world, world of uncertainty, thinking like a homo moralis, or they're in a, a world of certainty about the stakes and about the, the consequences for them, and they're more behaving like an homo economicus. So who are these people? And that is Eleanor Ostrom. I'll give her credit for that. That's a reading of a piece where I was like, oh, yeah, that's what's going on. Um, so she talks about how markets turn us into homo economicus because literally if you don't do that, you're going to be kicked out of the market. Your business is going to go bankrupt, okay? Versus voters in a representative democracy, again, that is more Schumpeter, they're not, there's no consequences to their actions when they're not behaving in a self-interested fashion. So there's no reason for them to be disciplined in that way, and so they're more likely to reason like an homo moralis. So applied to redistribution, Who's going to be the homo moralis? Well, it's high income respondents when they think about policies that affect the poor. Why is that? Because they're not affected. And good luck trying to understand how your taxes are affected by an increase in welfare spending. But on the other hand, low income, when they think about progressive taxes at the very top, they're not affected. They don't know if an increase in taxation is going to end up increasing their benefits. They're actually more likely to be ideological. Meaning that I need to know what they think about the fairness of market income differences to know how they're going to answer the question. Okay? So there's this kind of nice reversal depending on what type of policy you're talking about. All of these also vary depending on the design of the welfare state. You know, the book has kind of more information here. You know, Rob, I thought you had a question. Um, on the contrary, well, that's what I, sorry, that's what I meant. So I hopefully get the point here. So low income asks about taxes. On the other hand, high income responses <coughs> ask about taxes are much more self-interested. So the typical trick, right, is in a survey I say, do you think we should increase taxes to fund the NHS? Do you think we should increase tax at the National Health Service in the UK? Do you think we should increase taxes over people making a certain amount of income? That's pretty clear was affected. And guess what? The people right above support drops, right? That's kind of the intuition. So in the book, I put all this together in context. And so based on these micro foundations, there are three pathways to see attitudinal change when it comes to um, uh, support for redistribution. And none of them have to do with inequality per se. That's why you're seeing the disconnect to simplify. The one pathway is to actually change what type of moral concerns are being used. And so anyone who's worked on framing knows what I'm talking about. But what I've showed you is because these reciprocity concerns activate different parts of the population than proportionality concerns, it, it goes in different ways, okay? So change happens there. Another one is you change fairness beliefs. Pretty hard, but it happens. And the other one is you change the mix of motives people bring to the table when they're reasoning about policy. They could be doing more the fair thing or the self-interested thing. And so in the book, I look at how different contextual triggers kind of activate these pathways and explain weird things happening in all these different countries. This is more PR and ad for the book than actually walking you through this. But um, hopefully, um, that will make you want to have a, a closer look, especially if you're interested in some of these mechanisms. 
I just want to mention the fiscal stress one because it's really interesting. Uh, the argument here is that most of the time, especially the upper middle class, let's call them the bleeding heart liberals, are pretty favorable to an increase in social spending. In the French case, what is interesting is we see that happening and suddenly there's a decline. And it's timed with a tax increase by the Hollande government. Friendly to balance the budget, actually, not just to fund the social, social spending. And so I try to show, you know, have some evidence to show that actually suddenly they realize the cost of this altruistic support for more social spending and they revert to more self-interested uh, position. Okay, so to wrap up, let's go back to the puzzles. I'm gonna go pretty, pretty fast here, but um, the goal is to discuss the missing left turn. So what the hell was happening in Great Britain? I showed you this, right? Depending on the data set, it's stable or it's going down. So if my theory is right, we need to understand how fairness beliefs have changed or not, and which fairness beliefs are being primed by these questions. So remember um, what I showed you earlier, these items. So again, I take them and I do two indices to try to measure proportionality beliefs and reciprocity beliefs. Again, beliefs to what extent market income differences are fair, or beliefs about the prevalence of free riding among beneficiaries of social solidarity. And here is what you see. So I've coded it in a way that the higher values mean that you have a more anti-redistribution set of beliefs. And so for the proportionality beliefs, beliefs about whether or not, to some point a little bit, capitalism is fair or not, that's pretty stable over time, okay? So from the kind of late 80s to, to today, not much has changed in the aggregate. Where the action is, is actually on the reciprocity beliefs. And anyone who's worked on the UK knows what I'm talking about. Um, there's been this kind of turn against the undeserving welfare recipient, and that's captured in these survey items. With the Great Recession, it's recovered a little bit, but nowhere enough to compensate this conservative shift on fairness, uh, on reciprocity beliefs. And so what's going on here is, is a, a good old item ordering effect, again, for folks who design surveys. What's happening in the British Social Attitude Survey is that the income redistribution question, to what extent should the government uh, redistribute from the better off to those who are less well off, is coming right after the block of items that are asking about free riding. So basically, people are primed to think about free riding among the worst off, and as a result, Basically, the wording of the question that asks about the less well-off is picking up the decline, the conservative shift, and you're seeing the kind of parallel decline. There's a, a survey, uh, I don't remember the date now, it's 2014. I was able to find the exact same wording as the BSAS. It was an online panel of the British election study that did not have this item ordering effect, and their support is much higher for redistribution. Okay, so that's easy. You all know the story. I'm sure you've experienced that uh, surprising bad results with framing effects and item ordering. So let me show you what I mentioned earlier. This, these are the proportionality beliefs that I told you were very stable. See how they're um, structured by income groups. So basically, if you're in the top income quintile, you have more conservative. You're more likely to think, again, uh, market income differences are pretty are fair, at least more than if you're low income. And that is true irrespective of whether or not you identify with the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. Now let's look at reciprocity beliefs. If anything, the income gradient is reversed. It's pretty small. If you're low income, you're more likely to think there's a lot of free riding. Okay? Notice how most of the changes are actually happening among Labour identifiers here. So actually there was stuff happening on the elite side in terms of discourse that partly drove that change. I won't talk about it. What is interesting, though, is if I'm right, this change in fairness beliefs should have a big impact on how people think about policies that benefit you know, the low income, the unemployed. However, it should not affect people who are relying on these policies, right? They revert to self-interest. So here I have a situation where actually, if there were reasoning based on fairness, it's low-income respondents who should be super supportive of welfare cuts because they're the ones with the most conservative anti-redistribution kind of reciprocity beliefs. They think there's a lot of free riding, more so, if anything, than low-income, uh, high-income guys. However, in my framework, the folks who should reason based only on these types of fairness concerns should be the high-income folks because these are policies 
They aren't so, they're not thinking of them through the lenses of self-interest. So do we see that? So here I've put the full sample on the left and then broken it down by partisan identity and I've broken it down by income level. And so in the full sample, what you're seeing is that support for welfare cuts is going up at the same time as you see these conservative shift in reciprocity beliefs, the increase in the number of people who think there's too much free riding, fairness, reasoning, and action. It's unfair, thus you should cut. However, not happening for low-income folks. They don't want to cut welfare, right? They know someone who might rely on it. They think it's unfair. They think it's, it's benefiting free, you know, it's going to free riders, yet for self-interested reasoning, they'll oppose it, okay? So that brings me to trying to explain the United States in two minutes. <laughs> so why did we see a disappearing income gradient? Um, there, I'll just give you the flavor. Remember, the differences in support for redistribution between the rich and the poor are decreasing over time. There's no income differences in the population on average, but less so, twice less, I don't know if you say that in English. Anyway, there were twice more in the, in the end of the 1970s. The gap was twice bigger. So an often heard story is that it's the story of low-income white voters turning against redistribution because of racial resentment. That's kind of the pop story you'll see in newspapers. According to my story, it's actually high-income voters who are following reasoning in terms of fairness concerns. And so if we see a decline in the income gradients, it's because of high-income white voters with liberal pro-redistribution reciprocity beliefs were increasingly supporting redistribution because it's the fair thing to do. They're the ones reasoning morally, and they're the ones increasing the support. As a result, the gap is closing. And so this is the general social survey. It's what I showed you before. There's a lot going on in this graph, so let me walk you through it. So first of all, what do you see? Uh, this is the percent who agree that the government should redistribute income. Low-income Democrats, 65% agree, pretty stable over time. Low-income Republicans, a little less, but still, it's not a huge gap. There's a huge income gap on this question among Republicans, okay? The gap is declining because it's the gap among Democrats that's disappearing over time because you've seen this shift among, you know, the kind of high-income, leaning hard liberals fitting in this room, I guess. Um, but the point is, the movement is happening at the top from kind of fairness moral concerns. It's not a story of the bottom here. Yes, white Republicans are less supportive, but ultimately, at least for closing the income gap, the action is among the, the top kind of high income Democrats. I'll stop there because I'm sure there's 10,000 questions on the US case, so let me wrap up. Uh, this is just the ANES that finds the exact same results. So the missing left turn, what can I explain? So basically, what, the, what I argue in the book is that for most people, income inequality is an abstract concept. Like, I, I was talking to a gentleman at the beginning, like Kuznets actually invented the way of measuring inequality pretty recently. You could talk with historians of ideas, what is, it's an artifact of developing the concept of equality, right? Uh, and so it's meaningful to people only through the lenses of fairness reasoning. The inequality per se, without fairness concerns, means nothing. In the case of market income inequality, it's specifically the lenses that people wear are these proportionality lenses, right? They're the ones, this is the norm that you use when you think about market income differences. And so part of the disconnect between mass attitudes and income inequality follows from the stabilizing properties of fairness beliefs. So you run this tally, but once you reach a time you know, in your kind of life cycle where these beliefs are formed, they're actually not that easy to change, okay? And so I'm happy to discuss the there. The stabilizing properties also at the kind of country macro level. This is a theory paper by Benabou and Tiro that kind of models that very nicely. Another thing is that among elites on the supply side, there's been a shift away from politicizing pre-distribution and taxation policies, meaning policies that affect market income differences. And partly, this shift has benefited social solidarity, okay? But in practice, social solidarity is actually not that great at tackling inequality. So it's not doing a lot of work. I'll show you that in a second. And the last claim is that the proportionality concerns that we use, especially among my students, you know, capitalism is unfair, we need to give uh, access to education to all, the system needs to be more meritocratic. Well, in 
historically, that kind of norm is not very good at triggering radical redistribution. Okay, so I'll just walk you through that very briefly. This is evidence that these uh, beliefs are pretty uh, stable. I won't go into tons of detail how I measured them, but basically the idea is that based on survey data, I can tell you that country averages in 99 on a bunch of questions that approximate what I call proportionality beliefs. Do you think capitalism is fair or not? Very correlated with what they look like in 2009, I think is this one, data. Same for reciprocity beliefs. That is evidence of a system in equilibrium. Okay, so if you again kind of trying to model this, it's hard to change things. So inequality might be changing, but the kind of policy, politics, public opinion side is pretty stable. This is uh, in British politics. What's really interesting is that if you take reciprocity beliefs, you break them down by income and by party. Basically, what you find is that beliefs about free riding, the prevalence of free riding, really are separate between the two parties. So within a party. The income groups, the difference is not huge. All the difference is between parties. When you ask about the fairness of capitalism, there's big income differences within parties in the UK. And so strategically, politicians, it's better to mobilize folks on reciprocity concerns than on kind of debating the fairness of capitalist institutions. So historically, all the kind of policy innovations have been about from welfare to workfare. I've been about fighting back against the workfare reforms. But it's been about social solidarity, not kind of radical redistribution in the, in the market, in terms of market income. The compromise on the left has actually been social investment policy. So that's a big thing in Europe. Let's invest in education to make access, you know, to, to kind of level the playing field. But in practice, these social investment policies, again, are not very good at redistributing income or at tackling inequality. I'll stop here. And so um, historically, when of high income inequality led to matters redistribution, it's when the rich were, rich were framed as profiteers, violating the reciprocity norm. And that's what happened basically during mass warfare. It worked also because it echoed people's personal experiences with economic hardship. And so I think what's happening around COVID is that even though we got closer to that kind of setup, <coughs> the welfare state kicked in and actually didn't kind of prevent it a lot of dramatic hardship that we saw during world wars, and so we didn't get that kind of, not that I'm arguing for that, I'm just telling you what history shows. Um, so in the case it was mass warfare. So hopefully I've convinced you that all the questions I started with have been somewhat answered, or at least you want to see the book to kind of see the rest of the evidence. Thank you. So I know folks might have to leave. Um, but folks want to stay more. Yeah, let's go to 120. Yeah. Um, let you manage your own Sounds questions. Good. Sounds good. So, who wants to start? Yes. I don't quite understand how the, the book resolves the puzzle of the missing left turn, right? So, if I understood the theory correctly, you invoke and rely on fairness considerations when you lack the information you need to map policy proposals and how they will affect you personally. But when I think of like the redistributive policies that I know about in the United States, like a fully refundable child tax credit, for example, or universal basic income or COVID relief check or anything like that, if I'm a low income person, it's, it's really not very hard to figure out how to map those and how much money is coming into my pocket. So why wouldn't I support policies like that? Like why wouldn't I? Yeah, yeah. and I'm person? pretty sure that if we had longitudinal data to measure that kind of specific policies, we would have seen an increase among the people who benefit, and if that population is increasing, then we would have seen it. To some extent, you're right that I cannot tell you for specific policies. You, you, you can, you, you know, if they're well designed and people can figure it out, you'll see exactly what you expect. Here in the book, partly because of data limitations, I'm more interested in the overall, again, sense of proto ideologies that are going to make people more or less receptive to pretty intense radical redistributive moves. And so how do you build a redistributive coalition? One is you have a lot of people who will benefit from it. This is Obamacare. Obamacare brought together a coalition of bleeding heart liberals who were 100% sure how they were going to be affected, and folks who were directly going to benefit. And so in that sense, um, it, it does explain the missing left, left turn in the following sense. I don't think we ever reach a policy that's designed in such a way that you have more than the majority that knows for sure they're going to benefit. And so there's a whole part in the book on why elites don't go into tons of details and how they're going to implement <coughs> stuff. Or when you do, when you actually give enough information, 
Then the other side, the losers, start realizing what's going to happen to them, and so they mobilize against. So in practice, we distributed policies. It's really about building co coalitions of coalitions of kind of what's fair, right? What direction we want to take uh, society. And a lot of what's been happening around redistribution, especially in the 90s, has really been about what is fair social solidarity. And so there you've seen some movements. So in the UK, to some extent continental Europe, and in the US with Clinton, they kind of, they, they didn't do great on that part. They thought they were going to, by cleaning welfare, as you know it, getting rid of the free riders, they would actually further increase the coalition around that component of the welfare state. In practice, what happened, and you see the same in the UK, if anything, it triggered people to think about free riding and either did not shift fairness beliefs or shift them in the wrong direction. And then you see some kind of counter reaction to that, trying to compensate the, the welfare to work for type of reforms. My, my point here is that that kind of supply side dynamics, focusing on that aspect of redistribution, it's fine, like it helps folks, but that's not what's going to tackle the kind of income in, market income inequality that you know puzzle left wing people who are puzzling over the missing left turn. If that makes sense. I think some little planners, but that's okay if you can. Okay. Well, we have a dinner plan, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the wording in one of the UK questions made me think about the. Who, how people are conceiving of who the re redistribution is to, whether it's to a small, like, top, very top to very bottom, or, or yeah, 1% yeah, to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'll put it in the oh, I, I, Well, I just thought, I don't, I don't have anything more. I just thought I would ask, does that make a big difference in attitudes? Yeah, so basically, the two things happening in the British election study, there's no kind of item ordering effect because they're not asked about the poor before, to simplify. But also, they're not asking about the poor in the question, right? It's towards me. So it's really redistribution from the rich to me versus here. And so you're totally right. Not only do you see on average agreement is a little lower, but then it picks up how beliefs about the extent to which free right, uh, the, the poor, the unemployed are actually reciprocating carrying their weight, being team players, that's changing and ends the decline. So you're totally right. The wording is kind of doing a lot here for this puzzle. Yes. Rob, and then... I wonder if you think there's a role for, um, uh, we, we call this motiv motivated reasoning, but motivated um, ambiguity. Uh, so um, I, was, I was recently traveling to the UK and I was struck by uh, the fact that there were four plows uh, driving on the road for every five miles I went. There were literally every day, 24 seven, they were out on the roads as public employees. Um, yet I'm sure uh, that if they were queried on your questions, they would remain quite vague about the benefits of all that public spending. Mm -hmm. I'm struck in the United States how the states, this is aggregate level now, but the states that receive the most uh, net benefit from the federal government, uh, that is they pay the least and get the most, uh, are the reddest of the US states. And the states that pay the most and get the least, uh, uh, the farthest on that ledger, are the bluest. So I'm wondering if you think there's a role for, um, just as folks think, uh, since I've done well, clearly it's merit uh, that drives how well you're doing. Um, there's something about uh, uh, the willful blindness is playing a large role here uh, to the advantage uh, So on the proportionality norm, again, because these beliefs are actually pretty self-serving. We have documented the mechanism, and like papers are literally pouring in on Twitter this week. I mean, <coughs> so if you if you you know propose people with two kind of news stories, one that tells like reinforces their friend's perception, and one against, they're going to choose the one, right? Um, and so we know there's like that kind of self-serving. Um, on the reciprocity side, I don't think we understand how these beliefs form, to be honest. There is a racial component in the US case, but it is kind of leveraging a norm and it racializes the norm. But again, in other contexts, it's not racialized. So I, I, 
these punitive attitudes, we don't know where they come from, and you know, everyone's been trying to think about this. So on the, um, I'm trying, but what you're talking about with the public goods worker and the plower, the plow machines, you're arguing that they were willfully not try to think about who benefits from this. I have to think about this. Uh, yeah, yeah, and in the South, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, I think to me, the way as I thought you were going is, it's going to be interesting at some point the Democrats decide that, sorry, the Democrats in rich states, so whatever, whoever's in charge, start framing things as these other states are, are, are doing things that are so against our, our, our moral values that we don't want to pull resources with them anymore. It would be a weird twist of history here. Um, so I'm thinking more in that direction. That's a that's a fair point. I hadn't thought of it. I don't know, and I've seen I've not seen any research on that. I argue that the uncertainty is an artifact of how redistributive politics work, which is complicated. <laughs> Redistribution is the sum of a lot of little policies. The redistributive consequences are played through the budget over several budget cycles, and we can borrow. So of course, most of the time, the redistributive consequences are delayed. And so that's why the French are the only country I found where actually the middle class only, or the upper middle class, was faced over a short period of time with a sharp tax increase to, to fund its social spending. Um, yeah. Um, so I hope, I think they're kind of nested questions. Yeah. So my first question is, do you see these kind of fairness beliefs um, as values? Um, or do you see them as more um, movable primes, yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially. And I think the nested question under that is I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this book and I'm trying to connect this to all the work on self-comparison of, uh, so like uh, Condit and Wachowski's and Melissa Sand's work on comparing yourself to somebody who is much wealthier. Um, and I'm sort of wondering how those two pieces fit yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So the first one on values, I think, where I differ from the value stories that, again, we don't dis... I am willing for parsimony, for parsimony to say the values are the norms and I'm focusing on two and they're enough. And we all agree. So I don't, I'm not a pluralist in that sense. I do think for a group to work well together, we need to agree on the type of stories we tell each other to justify income differences with the fact that there's a lot of social spending that's not, that's kind of going disproportionately to one group. And so in that sense, the value literature tends to think of competing values, and that's the source. I think it's, there's no competition on the values, there's disagreement on whether or not the status quo abides by what the values prescribe, the norms. Uh, the second one, what's interesting the self-comparison is to some extent, I'm, it's a <coughs> cop-out for me in the following sense. I'm studying voters who are, to some extent, behaving as third-party judges, trying to rule on what's fair or not. You are talking about the literature that's trying to understand when the judge becomes a participant and has to think about, do I deserve this income? Do I not deserve? Do they deserve it? So you're getting at the theory of fairness belief formation. So that's where that fits. And again, I, believe, I think I've read most of the stuff. In, and it's like, it's hard to, this, all these little mechanisms are playing in that direction, and so I would read that literature as feeding into the friends' group formation. And there's that, there's other mechanisms, there's, there's quite a lot. So here and then. Um, yeah, so I was wondering to what extent there's less of a call for redistribution because capitalism has changed and there's less perception of labor exploitation in the workplace under late capitalism. And so people just don't feel as aggrieved. I mean, I think there is a way in which people are trapped in cycles of poverty, but there's just isn't this sense of kind of brutal exploitation on the factory floor. And so maybe that explains why this kind of solidarity logic um, works differently. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering about stages of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, to some extent, that's what's so interesting, because this, this exploitative narrative has worked the best at a time of high growth in Europe, right? So, so it doesn't have to be true. It's just, the, and that's the part where I think we all struggle as social scientists. What, what are these narratives, and where do they come from, and how do they crystallize and stuff? But so there's two aspects to your question. One is, do you know the literature on the Fissard this should workplace, this should workplace, but this idea that the workplace is reorganized. The situation where you had the Ford factory, where you were kind of, could extract rent from your manager, and now the labor is actually in China and the manager is in San Francisco, and so the organizational innovation is making that kind of rhetoric harder. 
when I presented it, um, someone said, you're just describing neoliberalism. It's like, damn it. <laughs> like, this, I haven't mentioned the word neoliberalism in the book, because, again, I'm not sure what it means. Um, but there's something to the fact that I think uh, there is a kind of very individualist norm of that has, has actually come to Europe now, which is kind of fascinating. I still remember some of the remnants where you are responsible for your kind of own income. And that's and that moral worldview would, was associated more with the right as really spread to the left. And the role of the left is to make sure, again, that the playing field is leveled. It's no longer trying to shift the norm. Right? And that is an interesting. So there's been books on evolutions. Some blame the economists coming as advisors within the left. Some say there's something structural about globalization. Unfortunately, you can't test these theories. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it, I agree with you in that sense. Yeah, there was another hand up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, regarding the difference between labor voters in the UK and Democrats in the US, so it, would there be any possibility that um, different components of labor policies between the two countries are driving the results? For example, in the UK, when people think of the redistributive policy, they mainly think of the, the unemployment benefits or universal credits, something like that. Whereas in the US, it's more like EITC, BUSAM, or, or payment for low-income children, something like that. That kind of different perception drives the diff divergence, or do you have other theories? Or so actually, Great Britain has converged on the US model. Again, there were actually quite a lot of exchange between Clinton and Tony Blair, and they kind of restructured. The new labor was in power long enough to restructure the welfare state in a way that it looks more. The main difference comes from the federalism component. So in that sense, I don't think so. I think the way to think about this uh, in the book, the way I try to explain the differences, so basically you see these rich high-income Democrats increasing their support. You know, so the US is a case of a two-party system polarizing. And I do think one of the core disagreements this polarized over is whether or not social solidarity is done fairly. And so of course, there's other topics, but it's one of the main topics. So, you know, it kind of started with Obamacare to some extent. The UK is the case of a 2.5 party system that has converged over time. And so Brexit is a, is a weird kind of repoliticization of another dimension, which I think still has to do with reciprocity and redistribution, but that's for another talk. Uh, and so what you're seeing is actually a conservative shift among Labour voters following Tony Blair or a bunch of conservatives coming to the Labour Party because they're starting to agree with them how they think. And so again, it was this rhetoric of, you know, we're going to do redistribution, but we're going to do it to the deserving. And so they pumped up, a bit like in the US, transfers to kids, and they helped the single mothers that way. But the single men were just a bunch of jobless bums and got kicked out, unemployment benefits got, got kind of, um, decreased, et cetera. So again, more conversion on the US. And so again, the reason why I see differences is that the kind of supply side has followed very different dynamics on which aspect of redistribution got politicized by whom in what direction. And so again, chapter eight. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. I, I actually do have a question, but I feel like I want to make it, I want to give it to the floor first. Is there anybody in the back? I just had a, kind of on both a macro level and an individual level, I was wondering how you felt economic freedom impacted these, these core beliefs and norms, as well as, like I said, on an individual social mobility level. So if I've changed social classes across time, across my life or across generations, do you see an impact in these kind of reflections? Yeah, there is research. Again, it's not perfect because we're lacking the really long-term panel data that really capture the richness of these beliefs, but whatever one item we have, yes basically. There is a bit of a latent, because if you come from the low class, you have your parents' fairness beliefs, so you don't go all the way. So this is kind of a push and pull, but there's been evidence. I'm happy to for the people who are interested. It would be very interesting. Yeah. Email me. So I'm going to close you, this up. But oh, you, well, you need to ask your question. Okay, I just said this. I was thinking about the GSS, and I was thinking yeah. about the other dramatic societal shifts, and yeah. one is religious participation, certainly over that period of time. And to the extent... I'm just interested in your comments about the extent to which that shapes right, how people view reciprocity and fairness and all these other concepts and whether you think there's any contribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the part, and sometimes it goes back to the 
question. It's the part where, you know, I'm trying to be a comparativist, but yes. with micro survey data, so like not perfect. <laughs> uh, so on religion, I started by thinking that it played a role more in the sense of shaping people's understanding of what, what is the group they owe cooperation to, or right. the right. to. Yes. Yeah. But I'm seeing more and more ethnographies showing a weird form of new evangelical thinking that's not even, they don't even even care about that group. Yeah. And so, so I don't know, like, they're a bit of a wild card there, but the old school folks, I think it's their more understanding of, I'm not playing a game at the national level, I'm playing it with a smaller community and thus I'm not supporting it. You know, the board federal projects, yeah. Thank you for accommodating my question. Great, well thank you all for your terrific questions. Thank you, that was amazing. Thank you.